Phenols, these are organic compounds that have a hydroxyl group attached to the aromatic ring. And so the name of this parent compound, C6H5OH, the benzene ring with the OH coming off of it is phenol. Naming phenols. Derivatives of phenols are named using the general methods for naming aromatic compounds. So here we have metabromophenol, like we talked about in earlier chapters on aromatic compounds. Paraaminophenol. 246 trinitrophenol, also called picric acid. So name the following phenol derivatives. Well, here is our phenol. And we have a bromine coming off of carbons 2, 2, and 5. So we have 2,5-dibromophenol. We come over here, we have an ethyl group coming off of carbon 4. 4-ethylphenol, or we can say para, because it's in the para position. Both would be correct. And then here, on carbon 3 we have a nitro group, and on carbon 4 we have a chlorine. So, 4-chloro, 3-nitrophenol. And again, chloro went first before nitro, because in the alphabet, C becomes before N. So, 4-chloro, 3-nitrophenol. Some phenol derivatives are known by common names. So, 1-2 or 2-hydroxyphenol is catechol or we can call it ortho-dihydroxybenzene because the two H's are ortho to each other. Meta-dihydroxybenzene, resorinol. And para-dihydroxybenzene, hydroquinone. And those common names are used and so we will use them in class. Some phenol derivatives are used as flavoring agents. So vanillin is based off of a phenol. We have a methoxy group on carbon 2 and an aldehyde at carbon 4, that's vanillin. Cloves, eugenol, we have a methoxy group and then an allyl group coming off of it. And then thymol for, for thyme. We have our phenyl group, an isopropyl group bound to carbon 2 and a methyl group bound to carbon 4. So a lot of flavors come from these phenols. BHT is a phenol and an antioxidant food preservative. If you look at any cereal box, you will see BHT in here. This is BHT. And basically, this can undergo a free radical reaction and give a hydroxy radical to um, like a fatty acid in a, in a food molecule like a cereal. And it's very stable this way. And so it can reverse the oxidative damage. Uh, the same damage that causes your cereal to go stale if you leave it open for too long, uh, this can actually reverse that. And so BHT makes cereal last a lot longer than it normally would. Urushiols are phenols that are the active irritants in poison ivy. And so when someone gets poison ivy, this is actually the compound that set off the reaction in a person. The toxicity of phenols to microorganisms makes them excellent antiseptics. For example, 4-hexyl resorinol is used as an antiseptic in many pharmaceutical preparations. Um, the practice of actually packing these phenols into a wound during surgery started in the Civil War. And that formula is still found today in Listerine. If you look at the active ingredient of the mouthwash Listerine, it uses phenols such as this because they're extremely good at killing microorganisms and so it's really good as a mouthwash to kill bacteria. These methylphenol derivatives are effective disinfectants. Here we have Ocresol or that's orthomethylphenol is Ocresol. Metacresol, that's 3-methylphenol, Metacresol. And then Paracresol, that's 4-methylphenol which is Paracresol. So a methyl phenol is called a cresol. It can be orthol, meta, or para, and they are very effective disinfectants. The phenols occur naturally in plants like marijuana, the tetrahydrocannabal. And some phenols are used as pH indicators like phenolphthalenes. 
And again, molecules like these can be psychoactive, which is why marijuana has pharmacological effects on a person. And in some states, it's been legalized as a pharmaceutical. Um, and actually, one of the most important things it does is that it makes people eat food. And so it's really useful for cancer patients uh, because chemotherapy is extremely rough on the lining of the stomach. The lining of your stomach and intestines is actually replaced every four days. It's some of the fastest dividing cells in your body. And so chemotherapy targets the fastest growing cells of the human body. And so your stomach lining, you don't see it in a cancer patient, but they're pretty much raw inside, which makes eating really hard. And so when a patient doesn't want to eat, the application of marijuana can be extremely effective at making them eat, which is necessary for them to stay healthy and keep their strength. And so that's why it's uh, really useful as a medicine in those cases, um, especially with cancer patients. Adrenaline is a phenol derivative and a hormone. So here we have epinephrine. Um, the medical field stopped calling it adrenaline and now calls it epinephrine. But again, it is this phenol-based hormone. Phenol is a weak acid with a melting point of 41 degrees Celsius. So it is a solid at room temperature. And here we see the pH is 5.5, so it's a weak acid. And the table below is a comparison of the pH of phenol versus water, which is 7, and acetic acid, which is much more acidic with the pH down to 2.87. Phenols will react with strong bases like sodium hydroxide, but they don't react with weaker bases like baking soda. So baking soda cannot take off this hydrogen, whereas sodium hydroxide can remove that proton and get the O- on the phenol group there. Alcohols do not react with either sodium hydroxide or baking soda. So phenols are much stronger acids than alcohols. It takes a much stronger base than sodium hydroxide to deprotonate an alcohol. Phenol is obtained from coal tar, but it is also produced synthetically by the process shown below. Benzene reacts with propene to form cumene, isopropyl benzene. And this is then oxidized to form this cumene hydroperoxide, which then forms phenol in dilute sulfuric acid. And a byproduct of that is acetone. And this is actually why acetone is such a common solvent. You go to Menards, there's acetone. Lowe's, there's acetone. Acetone's used in nail polish remover. It's used in all sorts of industrial solvents because it's really cheap because it's actually a byproduct of phenol synthesis. And so a company is purposely trying to make phenol and they get a lot of acetone as byproduct, and so you sell that too. But it's super available because it's a byproduct of another industrial process. Ethers are organic compounds that have the general formula RO, R prime, where both R groups are organic. It can be alkyl or aromatic, and they can be the same as each other, or they can be different from each other. So here we have dimethyl ether. There's a methyl on each side. But here is methyl ethyl ether. One side is the methyl group, one side is an ether or an ethyl group. And as long as there's two organic substituents on this oxygen, and so there's just electrons here, it is an ether. Naming ethers. To name ethers by the IUPAC system, we need to learn how to name alkoxy groups. And an alkoxy group consists of an al alkyl or aryl group with an oxygen atom. It is named by dropping the ill of the alkyl or aryl name and adding oxy. So methyl becomes methoxy. Ethyl becomes ethoxy. Phenol becomes phenoxy. So naming ethers. We name the longest continuous carbon chain corresponding to the parent alkane. And then you name the remaining part as an alkoxy group. So this is methoxyethane. So there's two names here. We can either say methyl ethyl ether, and a chemist would understand that, or the more formal name, methoxyethane. We had uh, dimethyl ether, that could be methoxymethane methoxyethane. Both naming systems work. 
So common names are like methyl, ethyl, ether. Methyl or dimethyl ether are common names. And the IUPAC names are methoxyethane or methoxymethane or ethoxyethane for diethyl ether. Diethyl ether is the most common one. And so if you're in a lab and you do see an ether, it'll probably be in a metal can. And it is a diethyl ether. Ethers are not something you buy in large amounts because over time they can slowly oxidize from the oxygen in the air to form peroxides which are explosive. And so you don't want to do that. And so you, typically you buy ethers in small, small bottles and use it up pretty quickly once you open it. So diethyl ether can also be called ethoxyethane. Propyl butyl ether, 1 propoxy butane. And the 1 is telling you that the O is attached to carbon 1 of the butane, because it could also be attached to carbon 2. This one here would be a 2 again, and this one would here would be a 1 again. So now we actually have the choice. Give common names and IUPAC names for the following ethers. Well, here we have propyl ethyl ether, which we would call ethoxy propane. Here we have ethyl phenyl ether or ethoxy benzene. Properties and preparation of ethers. Ethers have a bent shape similar to water because there's two lone pairs of electrons coming off, pushing the other two groups together into a bent shape because the electronic geometry is tetrahedral, if you remember from the Vesper theory of chemistry one. And so you get the same type of bent structure in an ether for the same reasons because of these two lone pair groups. The lone pair groups are key in some ether chemistry. So for example, a, Grig a Grignard reagent, you need to use ether as a solvent because it's actually the electrons in these oxygens which are grabbing the magnesium atoms and pulling them apart from the magnesium ion to help form your compound. Uh, properties, they are polar enough to dissolve some polar substances like water slightly and they're nonpolar enough to dissolve many nonpolar substances. They do a much better job at dissolving nonpolar substances than polar substances. There is no hydrogen bonding between ether molecules because there's no OH group. So they have much lower boiling points than alcohols do. And so we see here the dimethyl ether boils at negative 24. Propane, which is a similar size molecule, boils at negative 42. So pretty similar um, boiling point. Ethanol, same size, uh, molar mass is really similar, boils all the way up at 78. And so we see once we have that OH group, we have hydrogen bonding and your boiling point skyrockets up. Ethyl methyl ether, molecular mass of 60, boiling point of 8. Butane, almost the same mass boils at negative 0.6 Celsius. One propanol, or two propanol, now you have the OH groups, the boiling point skyrockets up because of hydrogen bonding. So ethers have low chemical reactivity, but again, as we said, they slowly react with oxygen to form unstable peroxides, which are explosive. So it's always a bad day if you come into a lab and you find a bottle of ether in a back shelf that was forgotten about 20 years ago because it could blow up. And so again, never buy ethers in large amounts. Always buy small amounts and use them up and then get a new bottle because you don't want them sitting around oxidizing and forming explosive compounds in your chemical cabinet. The preparation of ethers here. We have intermolecular dehydration of alcohols, as we talked about earlier, forms an ether and water. And we have substitution reaction. If we have an alkoxide, which is a negative charge on the alcohol, that can kick off a halide and form an ether. And basically, your alkoxide group attacks in an SN2 reaction kicking off your halide, like a chloride or a bromide or an iodide, forming your ether and a sodium halide. 
And again, Williamson synthesis is often used to prepare mixed ethers. When you dehydrate an alcohol, you typically get the same group on each side. Because if you just have ethanol and you're dehydrating it, you get two ethyl groups. If it's methanol, you get two methyl groups. If it's propanol, you get two propyl groups. If it's isopropanol, you get two isopropyl groups on each side of the oxygen. And so dehydrating alcohols gives you symmetrical ethers. You got the same carbon group on each side. If you want asymmetrical ethers, uh, then we use the Williamson synthesis. And again, you use a super strong base to deprotonate an alcohol. So you have that O minus, which can attack and kick off your halide, forming your ether and your sodium bromide here. So write the equation for the preparation of phenylpropyl ether. Well, you're going to use the phenoxide here, which is phenol that has the hydrogen removed. Um, the benzene is not a leaving group, so you can't attack. Uh, let's say this was like bromobenzene. You're not, it's not going to react in an SN2 mechanism like that. As we saw earlier, uh, there's different reactions that the aromatic group does. And so this way you get the O minus, which can attack a normal carbon and kick off the bromine group to form your ether and sodium bromide. Thiols. This is an organic compound that has an SH group. Thio is always used in chemistry when there is a sulfur in the place where you would have expected to find an oxygen. So thioether. Instead of uh, ether with an oxygen, there's a sulfur. So thio means there is a sulfur taking the place of an oxygen, where an oxygen should be. And they are also called mercaptans. And they're named by adding the suffix thiol to the parent alkane. So methane thiol, 2-butane thiol. And this compound, this is what's added to natural gas so that you can smell if you have a leak. So when gas out of your stove smells, it's because this is added on purpose so that people can tell if there's a leak or not. Because the natural gases, methane, ethane, propane, and butane, have no smell. And so if you don't add something to them so they're stinky, you have no idea if you have a leak or not, which can become an explosive problem. And so this is purposely added to natural gases so that a person is immediately aware if there's a leak. Because the human nose is extremely sensitive to sulfur compounds.